And we have some great panelists here. I'll start on this side, just to follow the order. We have Paul Aerts of the University of Amsterdam, a senior lecturer of international relations, and his most recent book, I always have to mention. Is it in person? Is it out in person yet, Paul? Almost done. Almost done. The Persian translation is almost done. Saudi Arabia and Kingdom in Peril. Great book together with Caroline Roulands of NRC. The second speaker is Mina Noor. She's a senior policy officer for Iran and the Gulf States at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Welcome. On her right, uh, Heinrich Maté of Gisser. Do I pronounce it correctly? You can pronounce it much better than I can. No, it depends on the accent. Depends a bit on, on the Arabic accent. And uh, Heinrich does a lot of consultancy work for uh, governments, non-governmental organizations, business even, on Iran and, um, and the opportunities that might arise and on other regional countries as well. Yeah. And last but not least, Heinrich Maté. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Hamed Hashemi. I'm sorry. Um, Hamed, I had trouble introducing you. Um, you're an independent researcher, writer, and journalist, but you're also connected to Tilburg University. Yeah, I'm, my field is, is a political and moral philosophy in Tilburg University, a few hundred kilometers south of here. But I have been focusing on Syria uh, crisis for the last five years, and uh, I've been researching and uh, extensively writing about this. Uh, mostly uh, uh, anonymously for obvious reasons. <laughs> Great. So we're going to talk about Syria. I'm going to give the floor straight to you uh, because you are going to tell us, so I, I have to stop speaking, you can tell us why we have to talk about Syria. Why is Syria so pivotal for Iran right now? Uh, because uh, Syria is a turning point in, in Iran's foreign policy. Uh, un unlike the domestic policy of Iran, which has had its own extreme up and downs during the last few years, uh, Iran has always uh, pursued a sort of consistent foreign policy beyond its borders, uh, along the lines of its own revolutionary ideals and uh, pan-Islamism that was a legacy of uh, Khomeini era. In every global conflict, Iran uh, consistently stood with what was perceived as uh, uh, oppressed Muslims, being the conflict, the uh, uh, Israel-Arab conflict, or the invasion of Afghanistan in the 80s by USSR uh, Red Army, or the Balkan Wars here in Europe. Um, Iran even, even didn't hesitate to find itself on the same side with, with the US and, and, and uh, regional rivals right, like Saudis. But after Syria, it has all changed. Iran seemingly is departing from its tradition and uh, putting up a new face and uh, I would say debut a new foreign policy. Uh, which in practical terms can be boiled down to uh, aligning themselves more with, uh, with, with the Russian bloc, if there is such a thing, and distancing itself from the neighboring countries, and uh, whenever possible, uh, easing the confrontation with the West. Uh, and accordingly, they are uh, changing their political rhetoric inside and outside. That's why I, I call it a, probably the sharpest turning point in Iran's foreign policy. And is there a, a massive domestic implication to that? I can imagine that the, the continued support for the Assad regime with all the atrocities that regime is responsible for must, have domestic prob must cause domestic problems for the Tehran government. Uh, yeah, they are paying dearly for that. It's probably not that visible, but they are, uh, I think they are losing the biggest asset they had. And by the way, that hasn't never been uh, a nuclear arsenal or uh, a missile program. It has been its soft power, and they are losing it in the region. The popularity of Iran has dropped dramatically during the last five years. 
And Iran has lost its, Iran never had many friends among the governments, but it used to have many sympathizers all around the Islamic world and beyond. And it has lost its, its revolutionary magic, I would say. And increasingly, Iran is being seen as a, a very aggressive imperialistic power uh, with, with a very uh, strong uh, sectarian agenda. And that's something that's probably a miscalculation by Tehran in long term. Could you elaborate a little bit? What is the miscalculation? Uh, I, I think they, they, they underestimate the, their biggest assets. They are... They, the soft they, power? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Interesting. Paul, this um, Syrian conflict... I'll get you my mic. I'll get you my mic, it's fine. The Syrian conflict is often seen as a proxy war by many commentators in the West. Um, Saudi Arabia, um, Iran in particular, and all the outside powers, of course. Um, do you think that in Riyadh and in Tehran this is seen in a similar light, as simply a proxy war between regional powers? No, I don't think so. Um, I think the sectarian dimension, in as far as it is relevant, and it became more relevant in recent years, more than it was at the beginning of, uh, let's say, the Arab Spring and what came afterwards, the sectarian dimension is more imported in Riyadh than it is in Tehran. Um, both countries, of course, have sectarian motives in their foreign policy, and more importantly, in their domestic policy. But we are talking now mainly about foreign policy. But I see it much more um, visible in uh, Saudi foreign policy, which claims to stand for the Sunni Islamic world. You know, it's the custodian of the two holy places, Mecca, Medina, and all that. And they explicitly talk about Sunni Islam. And many partners they're choosing in their so-called proxy wars are Sunni elements or Sunni groups or Sunni governments. On the other hand, Iran does that much less. And there's an obvious reason for that because Iran knows uh, being a Shia country, majority Shia country, which is a minority, as we all know, in the Muslim world, it would be not that beneficial to play the sectarian card so openly. So that's why I think, but I know there's a lot of discussion on this, but that's my view, that the Saudis do much more than uh, the Iranians do. I've got one point. Tone, are you still here? Ah, there he is. It's Ahmed instead. Um, I would love some audience participation, but there's two rules. Short questions. I'll interrupt any monologues that are presented as a question. And two, Ahmed has the mic and he holds on to the mic, so nobody gets it physically. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but please feel free to um, wave at Ahmed and he will stop by. Um, Can I wait? Yeah, you want some? I, want, I would like to add a, a few lines to what I just said, because you start by using the much used frame of Sunni Shia, and I don't like that. I don't think the conflict in the region is uh, mainly about Sunni Shia. That is what is being done in the media, that is what is being done by some experts, and it seems that we all buy that uh, framing. I think the, the core of the dispute in the region is about looking for regional power. And in that fight for regional power, or regional hegemony, if you would like to use the word hegemony, uh, sectarian elements creep in, but the core of the conflict has nothing to do with a religious conflict. Full stop. Great, thank you. I see you nodding. You would concur? I just agree. <laughs> yeah, just agree? Okay. <laughs> we have to talk... The, just sticking with Syria for one more second. Though technically Iraq, but we have to talk Mosul a little bit because it's probably on a lot of people's minds as well. 
Um, Hamad, I would like to ask you, um, a full loss of territory by ISIS, what would the repercussions be for all the fighting parties in, Iran, in, the, uh, in that particular conflict, and specifically Iran? Uh, I think it's too early to talk about post-ISIS era, uh, particularly because the dynamics in Syria, which is very different than in Iraq, in Iraq, the, the central government generally wants ISIS to be pushed out. It's not the case in Syria. In Syria, ISIS is uh, the second problem of everyone, including the Bashar al-Assad regimes, oppositions, Turkey, Russia. Okay, maybe the West, West cares about ISIS and only cares about ISIS, but uh, the parties that have the upper hands there, including Iran, uh, Russia, and, and Assad regimes, will make sure that, as, that ISIS will be around at least to the day that there is still one legitimate opposition group there because they want it, because they, uh, it, it gives them the legitimacy for, for, for the honest lots. And so I, I, don't, I don't see the ISIS is going anywhere anytime soon in Syria or some other lunatic Islamic group like ISIS, not necessarily the brand of ISIS. But uh, I, I agree that Iraq probably will solve this, uh, will capture back the, the ter ISIS territory and yeah. Yeah, so but the question... What was the question? No, the, yeah, you, you gave a perfect answer to the question, but the, the reason for asking is that um, in, in several Western media, um, you have the concept, uh, the enemy of, the, of my enemy is my friend. So all these countries and groups fighting ISIS are currently united in fighting ISIS and not in fighting among themselves. Would, would that still be the case if it's, if, if it's withdrawn to Syria? Definitely not in Syria. In Syria, uh, Assad regime hardly ever fought with, with ISIS, and Iran and Russia are following the same pattern. Mm -hmm. According to Jane's uh, uh, military analysis, like 88% of all the bombing by Syria by Russia has been outside the ISIS territory. Iran's record fighting with ISIS is absolutely zero. There is no such a case. So. Uh, Th then where does this image come from? Sorry? Where does this image in the West come from? Which image? That everybody's fighting ISIS. In Iraq they do. Only in Iraq? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I, ISIS would be around for a long time and, uh, and Europe is going to have a second. the refugee problem <laughs> yeah. for a long time. Coming back to your uh, explanation about the situation in, uh, in Syria and Iraq, uh, what is your comment on the current situation in Mosul? Because there are many groups playing there, not only uh, Iraqi government, but also Kurdish. And what would be your expectation about the role of Turkey? Uh, Turkey is a very tricky thing. I, I don't think we have time to get into it, but... <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, as I said, Iraq is very different and there are people are united and genuinely want ISIS to go back. Even Iran there is, is frustrated by ISIS there. It's kind of a slip over from, from Syria. But in Syria, the whole politics is different and ISIS has its own application to be there. That's what I'm saying. Probably, yeah, Mosul will be captured, hopefully, soon. Is that the you, answer? Would you, you want to respond? Yeah. My question was uh, how the situation in Mosul will influence the situation in Syria because the people, the Sunni people are under pressure and uh, if the government of Iraq get the Mosul, the situation will press, uh, suppress also the Sunni again and giving the, uh, more possibility to ISIS to uh, expand and grow. Absolutely. The, the, the previous uh, government of Iraq was much more sectarian than this uh, Ebadi. And he, he seems to be more sensible in the sense that he acknowledged the, the, the wrongdoings of uh, previous administrations. And 
people are more positive toward him. I, I, I know that there are many intrinsic problems regarding the oppressed Sunni population of Iraq, but uh, it's, it's difficult to say how, how, uh, how much of the Sunnis actually supports an entity like ISIS. I don't know what's, what what's everybody agree that ISIS didn't come from nowhere and the oppression on, on Sunni population was playing a, a very a central role. You wanted to respond, Jaime? No? Just very shortly, um, I studied Mosul in the past 10 years almost, you know, uh, when the Americans even were there. It's not an easy place to govern. It's, uh, it's a multi-group city. Um, so the chances of the central government in Iraq establishing complete authority there um, uh, for, 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 for all times to come is limited. I think we should, to understand what will happen, actually forget perhaps about the concept of ISIS at all and just say what will happen to Sunni groups and Sunni authorities inside Iraq um, ISIS can come or go. The, the main problem is that in the West, of course, we feel targeted by ISIS, and therefore that's the focus of our angle. But the angle is what should be happening with the Sunni communities in Iraq uh, and, 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 and Syria, and how are we going to develop that? ISIS is a minor issue. The Sunni uh, happiness in the, Iranian, in, in the Iraqi political order, that should be the main concern, actually. And I think Iran will try to keep it off balance up to a point because it is in its interest, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to the P5 plus one. I have to be short. I'm so sorry. I, we're we're going to touch on a lot, but we don't have time to go into everything deep. Moving to the P5 plus one deal. Um, Hamid, finally, do you think that that was partially also a result of, of the Arab Spring and the Syrian conflict in particular? Do you think that sped up the P5 plus one nuclear deal between Iran and the West? Or made it possible? Uh, I, I think the, the, the Arab Spring and Syria situation affected the other side of the negotiating table more than, than the US sides. Uh, um, Iran find itself to be fighting in several fronts, which was very difficult for them, then I, I think they decided to ease down the, the confrontation with the West and they can focus on Syria because they couldn't afford being isolated both on the West, both in the West and in the region. And uh, in, in this sense, Syria uh, contribute to, to this deal being signed up by both sides. But from the, the West side, and those, I don't think that there are reports coming out uh, that's suggesting the Obama administration wanted that legacy deal so badly that even they were close to doing some uh, compromises on other fronts, including Syria. So it's vice versa, basically. Yeah. It's the other way around. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Mina, hi. Um, um, th this was first, first for Hamad, but I'm, I'm, I have to speed things up a little bit. Um, we had a discussion before on, on whether or not there might be an isolationist tendency of the US um, being fed up with all the conflicts and all the wars in the region and, and withdrawing. And, would, and I would like to know of, um, of Mina if, um, of course, Europe doesn't have that luxury. It cannot withdraw from the Middle East as the U.S. can. Um, what what should should Europe do? Is there something that the Netherlands and the EU can prepare for? Can we make sure that we f co cover a U.S. withdrawal, or is that a serious problem if that would happen? Does it work? I'm not sure. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Joris. Thank you also for inviting me and congratulations to Radio Zamane. As mentioned by our uh, ambassador, it's a major event for us and we've been always, always uh, supporting the organization. Uh, before I go to your question, I think I would like to add sure. to Hamid's uh, remark that, um, that 
I think what also was important for Iran to uh, uh, move things forward in the nuclear deal, it was also the economic situation in the country. Uh, basically, the Western sanctions were tough, and I think it moved the country to uh, ha put some steps to uh, ensure that there could be economic activity and reintegration of Iran's economy back in the international uh, community. Now, getting back to your question on uh, whether um, what you should do uh, in case, uh, if at all, if. U.S. will withdraw. Um, I'm not in the position to say anything on that, on what would happen uh, uh, and speak on, on behalf of the EU, but I could sh shed some light on uh, our uh, Dutch activities to, to find out what a possible role could be for EU or the EU member states uh, to uh, support a rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states. And on that, uh, um, we, for example, organized an activity at the beginning of this year, and Paul was there, so he could add into uh, if, if he would like to. Um, that was one of the initiatives that we organized, the Track 2 initiative, where we invited uh, representatives, um, um, influentials uh, from the Gulf states and Iran uh, and uh, uh, EU member state uh, representatives to sit around the table in Brussels and talk about what can be done in the future to bring the countries together and make sure that EU uh, can um, uh, play, if at all, a facilitating role in that. Um, and interestingly enough, we found that most of the participants were eager to have a role for the EU. Uh, and that there was a need to, uh, for, uh, they saw the EU as a, as a party who could facilitate a step-by-step -step dialogue between the different countries uh, in the region. And I think it also fits uh, into uh, the Dutch policy of uh, having a, an even-handed even approach towards Iran and Saudi Arabia, which is also the policy of the European Union that we strive for, is that to... Um, make sure that we don't uh, um, uh, move towards a close cooperation with one while leaving the other one behind. We try to uh, balance our relations. And uh, as Kay said, from the bilateral perspective, we try to have a broad dialogue with, with countries in the region. So with Iran and with Saudi Arabia, we talk about econo economic development, about trade, but we also talk about the more difficult subjects, such as human rights and sensitive uh, uh, topics of uh, uh, the, the activities in the region. Um, Great, Paul, can you wanna, yeah, thank you. You wanna jump on that? Yeah, there are a few points I would like to mention. Uh, first, I don't think the United States is withdrawing from the Middle East. I think that's a huge misunderstanding. Um, there are some, they are changing the accent, so to say. They are putting some of their forces in Asia, but I would like to remind you that the United States still have 35,000, some say 40,000 troops in the Gulf. In each Gulf country, apart from Saudi Arabia, where it was kicked out because of Osama bin Laden, in each of the other small countries, they have bases, huge bases. So the United States is not withdrawing, at least not from the Persian Gulf region. Now, what could the role of Europe be? Um, I was indeed at the same meeting where Mina was, and there's another meeting next week. We have uh, with Saudis and Iranians talking about economic cooperation projects. And uh, they are very happy that we call them together and we do our best to make them talk to each other. I attend those meetings always with a very mixed feeling as happened in Brussels, and it happens next week again, I, I, I predict. There is still so much animosity, so much hostility between the re representatives from these two countries that it's so difficult to bridge, uh, although we do our best, and maybe some of these persons who are at the table do their best, but I think there is a long, long, long way to go before they can come to some real rapprochement. And I don't think that Europe can do so much. They have to do it themselves. What Europe could do, as a final remark, 
what Europe could do and should do is, and then I refer to the wider context of the Arab Spring and why the Arab Spring occurred and where it is going, could do much more in, in particular, North Africa, uh, Maghreb and Egypt included, um, change the change EU's economic foreign policy, widen up the European market, try to create much more employment for the millions and millions of jobless youth in North Africa, which are really uh, a sign of uh, the failing of the Arab Spring, if you would like to uh, use that phrase. And it will get worse. It will get worse. So Europe has a huge responsibility, and not only in the Maghreb, but also down in Africa. And there is no sense of urgency at all, neither in The Hague, as I see it, neither in Brussels, and the people will come. They will come by the thousands in the coming years. And we are not prepared to do something about that, at least not fundamentally. That was my cri de coeur. I can keep it. <laughs> I don't know how to move on from that, Paul. Oh, that's, that's up to you. <laughs> well, you've, uh, that is true. You've mentioned. Is there anybody in the hall who wants to jump in? Ahmed. Yes. I'm glad Paul uh, touched the subject, actually, because if the theme is the changing regional order and we're just focusing on ISIS and Mosul, which is just right now, and forget about the demographics of the region, the global warming, the uh, renewable energy thing coming up, all these things. I mean, at least we should talk about 10 years ahead and ISIS would just be like... True. Yeah, uh, we're moving to of, that. Of, yeah. yeah, because... Um, and, you have and, a question? And, yeah, the question is, uh, what would you think the, yeah. the region would look like Need. with all these... Uh, um, factors playing with Russia also, also um, playing the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your vision for Middle East in 10 years time? Let's move to Heinrich with a vision for the next 10 years time. But let me, let me try to narrow that down a little bit. Um, um, and this is also kind of relates to what, what Paul was saying. Uh, if you look at, at, at the World Bank and, and all the other institutes figures on, on intra-regional investments from one regional country to another, that is incredibly low in the Middle East and North Africa, much lower than in Latin America and in Asia and, and even, even Africa if you meddle it by income. Um, do you, do you, so um, what do you see for the next 10 years and do you see these intra-regional um, investments develop? Three minutes or four? Uh, three. <laughs> okay, the 10 years one I will leave for the, for the end because it is speculative. Um, I just want to link uh, Paul's statement about North Africa, very relevant. I do think the European Union um, in the State of the Nation by Mr. Juncker in September, I believe, said that more funds would go into investment uh, to develop in Africa. We know the European Union acts according to its own uh, dynamics, so this was at least on paper the policy. Um, in terms of the intra-regional uh, economic cooperation, let's take Iran because it is about Iran um, in the main. What do we see there? We see about 28, could be 27, could be 29, but a, a quite a number of joint projects, oil and gas related projects with states like Kuwait, uh, Qatar, um, uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, Iran hopes to sell some of the gas it produces eventually to countries like Turkey, um, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, and so on. So that's one thing. The second thing is what we're seeing is that with countries like Oman, which do not cons constitute a threat to Iran and which has always had good relations with Iran, um, pipelines are being built, uh, opportunities are investigated to do tourism uh, projects and so on. But that's of course at the lower level. So that's what I see in terms of the economics. Intra-regionally, it will happen. There will be a slight increase. There will not be a major increase. Because if we step back and we look at Iran, how I see Iran's foreign policy, and that includes its economic foreign policy, Saudi Arabia may focus on the Iranian threat, in quotation marks. But Iran does not focus on the Saudi threat. 
Iran's focus is, first of all, good relationships with China, India, Russia, Europe. Secondly, the th com combating the threat of extremist groups that may threaten itself or its allies. And then Saudi perhaps in a third position. So why should he change his economic policy? It will not. It will focus on the major powers and the major relations. Mina, do you want to respond to the earlier remarks? Well, maybe just minor comment to what Paul said, because I was thinking, and it wouldn't be fair to my colleagues working very hard on, on all the, the cross-regional subjects, such as environmental issues indeed, and water, and uh, uh, droughts, and uh, um, uh, two remarks. I think one, of, uh, uh, one is that, uh, uh, not speaking of the European Union, but I am speaking for foreign affairs, is definitely aware of these cross-regional, cross-border issues. And uh, we have actually since uh, the, this, the beginning of this year, uh, uh, several colleagues especially um, appointed in the region, in Amman, to work on uh, uh, environmental and water uh, issues from a, perspective, from a regional perspective. Um, secondly, also on that, we, uh, environment was one of the subjects that was discussed in these um, uh, talks between uh, uh, Gulf uh, representatives and, uh, and Iranian representatives as a, a subject which is uh, maybe an easier one to start cooperating on because it's less political. It can become very political, but from a, a starting point, it could be an entry point to sit together to, to discuss the issues of, okay, we will be, all of us in this region will probably at a certain moment deal with uh, a lack of water, uh, um, uh, uh, environmental degradation, etc. How are we going to deal with that? And um, again, there, the, the participating parties encourage the EU to bring the parties together. Um, so, again, it's not an, a complete answer to say, yes, we do all these things already, uh, but it is a, a slight nuance to say that there's a lot of people busy working on it, but it's not easy. Thank you very much. I, I, I want one quick remark is that we've specifically singled out within this event environment and that's a separate section, separate session later today because the environment is very important. Moving back to uh, what you said, Heinrich, and also um, a recent article in the National Interest um, by Dina Esfandiari and Ariane Tabatabai. Tabatabai, difficult name. Um, which basically states that Iran is uh, the number one concern for Saudi Arabia and quite, quite differently for Iran, Saudi Arabia is not even among its top ten concerns. Um, could you and Paul maybe um, ex ex explain what the difference is? How come this perception is so different between the two while we here in the West see them as the two rifles in the region? Yours? Just I have to add, we, we still have 10 minutes. Really. Okay, sure. I, I think I will leave the Saudi part to, to Paul because sure. he's the expert on Saudi, I'm not. Um, Iran, of course, is a, is a major power in history uh, where it is. It has a considerable cultural and political legitimacy as a state. Um, the Saudi state emerged in a different way um, they, they, they're basing their legitimacy on, on the link also to Sunni Islam and being the custodian and so on. And Iran, I think, differentiates between its own legitimacy as a political order, its own position in the, in, in the region, its potential, and then looking at, at Saudi Arabia. And I think that plays a major role. There is a power difference. There is, in Iran's view, also a status difference. There is, in Iran's view, I think, looking 10 years ahead, definitely a more optimistic vision of what's possible for Iran compared to Saudi Arabia. Paul, are the Saudis worried? Oh, just a few uh, words on this. There's a very nice phrasing. It was uh, given to us by Karim Sajadpour, who's a well-known analyst. Uh, he said, the Saudis have an uh, inferiority complex when it comes to the Persians, and the Saudis have a superiority complex when it comes to Islam. That's a nice, nice uh, thing to remember. Now, Saudi Arabia in general 
and I know the country quite well, is really obsessed with Iranian expansionism, between inverted commas. It's rampant in the country, it's among the average citizen, it's among the intellectuals, it's among the political elite. And uh, how come? That uh, requires a long debate, so I will not go into the causes of this, but it's really the number one, as Heinrich already said, it's the number one priority for Saudi Arabia, to stop Iran getting more influence uh, in the region. Now, strikingly enough, if you look carefully at Iran's foreign policy, Iran would be present and would be as active in the countries where it is active, namely Iraq, Syria, Lebanon via Hezbollah, in Afghanistan, don't forget Afghanistan, it would even be active in these countries if there was no Saudi Arabia at all. That's, that's a major observation to make. So Saudi Arabia is an afterthought, as was written in this National Interest Art. It's an afterthought for Iran. Saudi Arabia thinks it's so important, but for the, at least for the political elite in Iran, Saudi Arabia doesn't matter that much. And that is very difficult to make Saudis understand. I will try to do that next week in the next session we have, but that's a tall order. <laughs> I have Thank a small uh, question. Yeah, sure. I have a very short uh, question related to the shrinking space of civil society and also the freedom of expression. And if you look now at the last years where we saw maybe a little bit of uh, improvement after some things that happened in Tunisia and elsewhere, but now with the shrinking space of civil society and freedom of expression and trying to connect it also to getting back into business with Iran, how do you see your strategies or related to how can the economic development also open up civil society and how can economic development give opportunities for freedom of expression? Is this for someone? Heinrich? For me, and Heinrich. Um, I really appreciate it. First of all, I felt honored that uh, I could listen to Ms. Ibadi today. I think her statement that freedom of expression is essential for good education is, is, a, is a key statement that we should hold on to. For business, you know, you, you come from civil society, you, I will describe it as an apple farmer. If you give advice to a pistachio farmer, a businessman, it will not work. My own recommendation to, to business people is that don't focus on shouting about the lack of freedom of expression. Focus on the other side of Ms. Ibadi's suggestion, which is education. Business education, transfer of skills, which will hopefully allow people also in Iran to, to, to gain better jobs. And that is where I think business could make a difference. Education, transfer of skills, transfer of knowledge. No. Can, I, can I make an observation here, a critical one? I don't think that businessmen care so much about freedom of expression, as long as they can make profit. Halas, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and that is why I think it is possible that businessmen will actually invest in education because they will gain a benefit from it. Mm, a lot has been said. Maybe. Um, what I can add is that from a government point of view, I think for us it is important to, um, when we build up, it was already said, when we build up the relation with Iran, it's as a government, we try to encourage econo economic activity and trade, but we also try to talk about human rights. And that is something that it's part of the, the, the broader dialogue. So when there are trade missions, human rights is also always being discussed, meaning that we don't say trade is more important than human rights. It's always on the agenda. That's on what we can discuss. Also, in practice, in the Netherlands and, and Iran have agreed to 
uh, uh, on a roadmap uh, uh, with several points of focus areas. And one of those focus areas is that the, the Dutch government would be working with the uh, companies to uh, uh, support the um, CSR and uh, uh, international human rights. So that is something what has, that has been agreed between the Iranian and the Dutch government when it comes to trade and, uh, and business. But again, it, the, there could be skepticism on it, and I think it's up to businesses to whether they care or not about the human rights. Uh, but from a government perspective, this, this, is, this is, I believe, something that a government can do, and we could push uh, forward every time we have talks with the Iranian authorities. Paul, briefly. Mina knows what I'm going to say now. <laughs> <laughs> because we had the discussion before, but I have to repeat myself. You know the phrase of double standards. And if there is one standard, I always say, it is double standards. The Dutch government, as many other governments, so I'm not uh, singling the Dutch uh, government out, uh, it is doing as the others do. Namely, if you have a friendly relation with another government, you are much more lenient, much more lenient on criticizing that government when it, is, uh, uh, when it comes to human rights violations. When you do not have a friendly relation with another government, you criticize that government much harsher than you do the other one. And that is double standards. And that is the standard, unfortunately. Uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, it's, it's, it's very uh, obvious, you know. So much criticism on Iran, and so little, maybe behind doors. That is always what is being said by the human rights ambassador. We, we don't have this megaphone diplomacy because that doesn't, we do it behind doors, silent diplomacy. I never believe, believed so much in silent diplomacy. So this double standard is a persistent problem, unfortunately. We're gonna spend most of this afternoon and evening talking about human rights, so let's leave it at that for the moment. And running out of time, very briefly, because the intention of this panel was very specifically to give you an overview of, of some of the burning issues in the region, but also to move beyond that into a more positive cooperative setting, and we very hardly touched on the last bit. Um, Heinrich, moving from the nuclear deal between Iran and the, rest, and the West, the, the anticipation was that there would be massive business opportunities and that, that trade would, would start flowing. Um, it has happened very, very limitedly. Could you explain? Are we just too eager? Are we in a hurry and do these things take time? There were limited economic relations for 10 years. I think we should allow for another two years. Too eager? Yeah. That's it. Specific issues? Banking? I think banking governance in Iran and even corporate governance in Iran uh, have taken a different route compared to that of the companies that want to operate there. It will take time to have a fit that suits both parties. Mm -hmm. I'm looking with Ahmed. Done? Okay. I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Hamad. Thank you, Heinrich. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Paul. <laughs>